Hey everybody, um, thanks so much for having me. Uh, great intro. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Kegan Schuenberg, founder and CEO of Souls. Uh, we're focused on making custom footwear affordable, accessible, um, and made on demand. As Matt mentioned, uh, I spoke at this, uh, I think it was about two and a half years ago, right when I had just founded the company. I'm pretty sure we were pre-seed pre funding. Since then, uh, we've grown to a 50-person company. We've raised about 20 million in venture capital. We operate in both the B2B and uh, most recently the B2C sectors. And uh, we are one of the only companies that I know of that is scaling uh, 3D printing um, and mass customization uh, into the consumer market um, and really addressing all the challenges that that comes with. Now, when I got up on stage uh, two and a half years ago, I talked about evolving our physical world and I talked about how we evolve our physical world at the rate that we've evolved our digital world and why that delta exists and why I still look at my window um, and I see things being uh, made by uh, literally people building buildings and cranes and I see the speed at which it takes or I see how slowly it, um, the physical world evolves. And I said to myself, how can we use 3D printing to change that? And I targeted uh, footwear and most, more specifically orthotics and insoles as a starting place um, because that was a product um, that was ready for the technology with where it's at today. Um, and over the past two and a half years, I'm going to go back on that a little bit and I'm going to talk about debunking the myth of 3D printing, which it sounds like has already come up a few times tonight um, as something that I think there are a lot of question marks around and as one of the leaders in the space and as one of the companies uh, truly scaling a mass customized product uh, that uses this technology, um, I want to address some of the pitfalls that we've come into um, and as people out here and as entrepreneurs um, and as inventors looking at the technology, um, pitfalls that you may might run into as well and how to think about 3D printing in the context of your companies. So at the end of the day, 3D printing uh, and its most basic form is really a hot glue gun. You've got a hot glue gun and you're melting plastic and you're turning melted plastic into parts. Now, if you go online and you search for 3D printing, probably two years ago, um, you would have got a lot of tchotchkes. Today, you will still get a lot of tchotchkes. Um, in fact, uh, Amazon most recently launched a 3D printing store, and I know people at Amazon, and I know people working on the 3D printing store, and there are a lot of great things going on there. But the first problem is that it's listed as the 3D printing store. Um, and now, searching uh, for a very quick list of products that are made with 3D printing, I got this list from GQ, listing the five worst items available for sale in the store. And I thought to myself, well, let's see what they are. Now, the first problem that I see here is that all of these products have 3D printed in the marketing description. We've got a 3D printed do-it-yourself futuristic bow tie, which we saw on the last page. I don't know how many people here wear bow ties, but I certainly don't. We've got a 3D printed poison skull, which we can see uh, to the right. We have a 3D printed wicked witch, which I'm sure you can all imagine. A 3D printed create your own slim wallet, which was actually made by a friend of mine, so I've got to give her a nod to this, to actually creating a functional product, um, but still has a long way to go. Um, and most importantly, a 3D printed Chrysler building that was too big to fit on the build plate, so they just printed the tip. Uh, <laughs> this summarizes where the market is at and where the technology is at. Now the question that I have to ask, and the question I actually asked at Amazon the last time I was there, was when was the last time you bought something at the injection molding store? Nobody goes to the manufacturing store and says, hey, let me look through all these injection molded products and let me buy one of them because that's what I'm really excited about. 3D printers make parts, not products. They are one part of the larger whole. Um, if I look at what we're doing at Souls, we use 3D printing for about 20% of our total product, and we're actually working towards our biggest product launch yet, which is gonna be this Thursday, and what's one of the biggest questions that we're asking ourselves is how can we can continue to reduce the 3D printed component of it so that we're really concentrating on the functional areas of the part um, and focusing on how can we make a better experience for our users um, through other manufacturing technologies. Now you contrast that to a typical product, and this is obviously on the extreme end of the spectrum, but a single car has about 30,000 parts, and those parts use different materials and different manufacturing processes and have different functions and different mechanical properties, and they're all assembled in different ways to create what is a finished product, and some of those parts might even be 3D printed. Now. I know one of the promises of the technology has always been about reduced complexity, and it's about saying, hey, well, maybe that car doesn't need to have 30,000 parts, and in fact, it probably doesn't. If we looked at what GE did with their turbine, that was a great example of how to reduce complexity with 3D printing. There's some amazing innovation happening here. But ultimately, and as we saw in the last presentation, and I love these pictures of sort of these material explosions, we haven't yet figured out, figured out single materials yet, so how are we gonna move on um, to the phase where we're really and truly thinking about multi multiple materials? Now every time I say this, somebody always inevitably brings up the object connex machine and they're like, but wait, there's this machine out there and it works and today you can print multiple materials. And I can tell you that we printed the first pair of soles ever on that machine um, at a company that is across the street from us and our office over in Chelsea. 
And I got that product and I think I wore it once and it fell apart. That is the state of the materials that we are printing today. There are very, very few materials out there which can be 3D printed that are actually suited towards industrial grade applications. In fact, you're really looking at nylon or nylon. Um, and those are your options. And you're thinking about what kind of products can you develop with those materials and are they relevant to what you're actually making? Now, if I think about the delta between part and product and what's really dividing those two things, um, there's these really core pillars, and we've heard these referenced through a few, a few of the presentations tonight, and uh, probably in a much more articulate way that I'm going to cover right now. But at a very high level, we've got design, testing, assembly, and quality. Now, at Souls, at the very, very beginning, you know, our biggest thought was let's get to market, and let's do that with software. So we focused on building software that could create mass scalable, customized 3D printed product. And we've done that. Um, and as we look towards what we're launching, over the course of the uh, next week, we have amazing um, automated backend systems um, that can produce customized products. Um, but in doing that, we skipped these big stages, which is like, hey, we have to wear test these things, and hey, these are products that are gonna go in people's shoes, and hey, the shoe is a really, really harsh environment in which people sweat, and there's all this force that's coming down from the body day after day after day, and it's coming down on this 3D printed product, and what kind of tests are you using to verify that, and how does that stand up against the rest of the industry? Now I want to take a really, really simple example here, and this is probably one of the most like most 3D printed products out there, and it's a cell phone case. And here we have kind of an industry standard. Uh, it's in case, it costs about 30 bucks. And when I look at the product description, which I'm pretty sure I pulled off Amazon, it describes it as uh, a durable hard shell exterior co-molded with a soft impact absorbing inner layer for complete protection in a flexible, secure, and lightweight form. Sounds great, 30 bucks, if I used iPhone cases, might consider this one. Now let's contrast that to a 3D printed iPhone case, also $30, the bubbly iPhone case, 3D printed with a matte finish and a slight grainy feel. This is the difference between these two products, and this is the difference to, between where the 3D printing industry is at, um, and ultimately consumer products on the shelf. I will never forget the first time that I saw Souls. Um, we did a kiosk at the mall up in Westchester, and we were right next to the Nike store. And I thought, oh my god, how great is this? We're going to capture all this traffic going to the Nike stores, and we're going to outfit their, uh, their Nikes that they're ultimately purchasing with Souls. And then I saw what our product looked like next to theirs. Um, and I thought to myself, that's the gap that we have to close, and I'm excited to be the company closing that gap and I'm excited to be the company thinking about what that even means but there is a huge gap there before this technology truly becomes relevant um, in the eyes of the general consumer and even what the consumer perceives as finished product. Now, that all aside, let's step back a second because I love 3D printing. Um, and if I didn't, I wouldn't be here talking about it. And I think we've accumulated an incredible amount of knowledge about what this technology can do and how it's relevant to people's lives. So let's say you want to make a 3D printed product. The first question you should be asking yourself is why? Is this really the technology that you need to choose? If you're making a custom product, are there other ways to do it? Something that I ask myself every day is as I look at beyond 3D printing, and now I'm looking at digital customization and digital manufacturing in general, what other production processes can, can make customization possible? But let's say you've answered that question, you say, no, 3D printing is the way to go, this has got to be 3D printed. You should probably ask yourself why again, but let's keep going and let's look at the pros. We've got a few things, and if you notice, these are things that Souls is all really good at. Um, low volume production, Souls are made on demand. They're made for you, um, they're made at the point of order. You basically, you download our app, you take three photos of your right foot, three photos of your left foot, we automatically process those photos real time, um, and we turn them into a customized product for you. I'm very proud to say we now have a fully automated system doing that. Uh, customization, they're 100% custom. Uh, and finally, complex geometry. While this is something we're probably not pushing to the limit, um, it is one of the advantages of 3D printing. Um, and looking at how you can increase um, complexity and use it to improve product performance um, is one of the really interesting areas that people are experimenting. Now on the con side, um, if you're really choosing to go down this, uh, this direction, you have to think about these things and you have to think about how can you turn cons into opportunities for your company. Um, we've got cost, speed, surface finish, and mechanical properties. Um, cost, you've got a much more expensive manufacturing process than something like injection molding. And you have to think about how that factors into your margin structure and your end product. Speed, you can, is it relevant to your market? Is there market sensitivity? Do they care about lead time? In the land of orthotics, traditional lead time is, let's say, four to six weeks from a doctor. So at Souls with five business days, we're much faster than anything on the market. Surface finish, um, post-processing. I hate layer lines. I hate looking at parts and thinking that they look 3D printed. So one of the things we focus on is how can we improve post-production and how can we develop technologies that ultimately uh, make better looking parts. Um, and ultimately mechanical properties. There's limited materials out there, the properties aren't well, well known, and you need to be thinking about what your application is um, and whether the technology will work for your application. 
At Souls, um, 3D printing is 20% of our product and 60% of our cost. Um, that gives you an idea of how that factors into margin structure. And when you're actually thinking about scaling a technology like this, um, what it takes to do that and what effect it has on your COGS and ultimately your selling price to your end consumer. Now, that all aside, um, over the past two years, the biggest thing that has changed in the industry, and when I started this, there was this massive, uh, let's call it a gold rush in venture capital to the application layer of 3D printing. And MakerBot um, had raised all this money, and they'd sold for an incredible amount of money, and everybody was saying, we've got all these machines, and what are we going to do with them? And everybody was looking at the application layer. Um, and I think over the past two and a half years, venture capital has moved on and is now looking at AI and drones and virtual reality, um, whereas we see the major shoe companies, Nike, Adidas, and Under Armour suddenly have replaced them and are on this gold rush um, to 3D printing and looking at how it might fit within, uh, within their world. December 15th, uh, 2015, Fortune Magazine asked who's winning the 3D printed shoe race. Um, and what we saw is all three of those companies over the past year um, both said that 3D printing was a major part of their manufacturing and distribution strategy going forward, um, but ultimately printed shoes that look somewhat, some, 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 somewhat like this. Uh, and they combined a digitally knit upper um, with a sort of lattice structure that we've all become very familiar with. Um, and they did that in the midsole using something called zoned cushioning, which is kind of like the buzzword of the shoe world, um, which is this idea that they can create custom cushion for the individual that's responsive to, let's say, a player's or, um, uh, or an individual's movement. Now, the thing that is not considered when you look at this, and when I look at the media's perception of where this technology is at and the reality of where it's at, and this was something that was posed to me by the CEO of a very, very large uh, publicly traded company um, that does a ton of 3D printing, is what happens when you go running in them and suddenly you have materials that degrade. You're running through mud, you have lattice structures, um, and you have a product that probably costs your customer about $1,000 uh, at current cost and is, uh, and is no longer viable. Um, and once again, we go back to that delta and we go back to looking at what that looks like in the delta and the difference between prototype and product. Now, with that all in mind, you have to ask yourself, why all the hype? And if you look at the hype cycle, and this is specifically related to 3D printing, prototype and indus prototyping and industrial applications are really cresting over into productivity. Um, these work today. There are many, many companies um, that are using 3D printing today in industrial applications in very, very successful ways. Um, consumer 3D printing is still five to 10 years out. So if it's still so far away, why are so many companies paying attention to it? Why is the COO of Nike getting up and saying that this is their future, and why are they filing so many patents year over year around this technology um, and looking at the potential implications that it has for their product line. Um, and when we really drill down, we see a couple core things. There's labor costs um, from the same Fortune article. Uh, behind the scenes, 3D printing has the potential to drastically shorten the supply chain, slashing labor costs for shoe companies. This past product that we're bringing to market, we developed over the course of the past eight weeks. Um, and we did that using digital manufacturing technology. You contrast to that to a traditional shoe company that's taking a year to two to bring a product to market, and suddenly you have an incredible ability to have a closed loop feedback circuit with your customers, where you're not just doing research and then shipping a mass manufactured product based upon that research and hoping you did a really, really great job, um, but you're actually continuously testing and continuously engaging with your customer base. Um, on the product development timelines, um, same thing, on average, a year or two um, to bring a shoe to market. I think Adidas is on the high end of that spectrum, Nike is on the low end of that spectrum, but everybody's asking how can they become more relevant to their end consumer and how they can close that gap. Um, and finally, mass customization. Uh, I wouldn't be up here if I didn't believe in the future of mass customization. To me, it seems ridiculous that it's 2016, we get up, we put on shoes, they don't fit, they're standardized. Um, we hear eight out, what is it, eight out of 10 people um, experience some sort of foot problem. Most don't do anything about it. Um, these are problems that are ubiquitous, that we all understand, that we all live with, that we should be able to do something about. And 3D printing has the potential to radically change the industry and to shift it from something that's very, very marketing driven um, to a product driven industry where footwear um, and shoes are made on demand, you have your scan on file, and you buy products against that. And that's the future that I'm excited to be part of. But I don't think it's going to come from the big shoe companies. And I know that I, I, I definitely uh, stand alone on this um, in, certain, in certain settings. Um, but it's my, uh, it's my opinion that this kind of innovation has to come from entrepreneurs like you. It has to come from the innovators. It has to come from small companies that are thinking about, how can I build custom businesses and actually integrate this into my business model, into my cost structure, into how I think about the products that I'm developing? Because it does not look the same as what a larger company's supply chain looks like. I mean, it can't. That's just the reality of where we're at and where the technology is.
So if you're thinking about starting a company using this technology, very simply, don't start a 3D printed chocolate company. Um, the world doesn't need anything like this. They also don't need more tchotchkes or more action figures or more little Star Wars drones, even though all of that stuff is great. Uh, but really, um, what we should be doing is looking at the applications and the potential of this technology um, to really make products affordable, accessible, um, and made on demand. And that's where I get excited. It's about saying, how can I give access to someone that didn't have access to a product that couldn't afford a product and actually make something relevant to them and do it with technology. And that's the power of software. It's the power of scalable mass customization. Um, and ultimately, it's the power of what we're doing at Souls. Um, someone said to me uh, earlier this week, uh, a 3D printer isn't a factory in a box. It's a box in a factory. It's one tool in your supply chain. It's one piece of the puzzle. And it's one component in thinking about how you're going to develop an amazing business, uh, hopefully integrating this technology, whether it's in the prototyping stage or in the product stage. Um, this is the future of mass customization, and while it's, uh, it's going to be a slow burn and we're going to get there, uh, not overnight, but we will see a, a fundamental change in the marketplace over the course of the next 10 years, and uh, I hope that Souls gets to be part of it. So, thanks. <laughs>
days. And uh, if you look at who our investors are to date, um, you know, our biggest ones being Founders Fund and Lux, uh, the reason that they're invested in the company is very much about the software. And it's about being able to actually create end-to-end -end software that enables scalable mass customization, both for orthotics, for insoles, um, for other products that fit our bodies. Um, and looking at when we reach that point where we as people you know, have our scans on file, have our bodies on file, and we buy products against that, I'm sure you can imagine you buy one pair of shoes that fits perfectly and you never buy another pair of shoes um, from anybody else again. Uh, so the biggest challenges are really cost. Um, so, so thinking about, well, cost and design for manufacturing. So um, I, I think that a common misconception with 3D printing is sort of like, you know, put a CAD file in, anything comes out. Um, but really, like a lot of engineering has gone into what soles look like um, to optimize for manufacturing and to ultimately optimize for cost as well. Um, so that's very much part of the thought process, and you don't gain that understanding unless you're actually doing it yourself. Um, and the second part of that, yeah, it, it depends on the, the structure. In most uh, service bureaus, uh, the margin built in, the margins are so slim already um, with what the cost of goods look like that you really can't afford to, to have too many people integrated in that process. Uh, great talk, by the way. <laughs> um, so you talked a lot about the enterprise applications of reprinting. Do you think that the consumer side of things is kind of fizzled out, or is there a market for it in the future. So all the hype, at least from my experience, came from like the consumer aspect, like printing out the top of Yeah, so I, I, there's two sides to that. On the machine side, you know, it's interesting. I've been in 3D printing probably 10 years. I've never actually owned an at-home 3D printer. So that, that to me says something, nor do I want to own one. Um, so I, I, I think that definitely speaks to things. I, when you think about like this distributed manufacturing layer, and it's exciting, right? Like this idea that there could be machines everywhere and you could, you know, have a cloud where you're sending files to the machine locally or maybe in your house and you're printing products like that. That's great, but like I go back to the same thing that like parts, not products. And that, that like very much is the gap there. So until those machines are advanced enough that they're actually, you know, really like the sort of like replicator where they're making these sort of magical connected devices that have multi-material and properties, um, I think that, um, that getting there is a challenge. On the consumer goods side, you have to be solving real world problems. I've seen so many companies fail in the mass customization space because they think that somebody wants something customized that nobody wants customized. Like people just don't care. And I mean that in the nicest way possible. But like most people don't need custom products. Some products need to be customized. Um, um, and that, that is the difference, and really looking at areas where the application makes sense, where you're adding value to the consumer's life. Um, for people to buy souls, they have to jump through hoops, like it's part of the process, and we're working on making that process easier, but inevitably, they still have to download our app, um, they have to take a series of photos, and they only have to do this once, mind you, and it probably only takes, let's say, seven to 10 minutes for them to do it, um, but it's still a series of hoops that's much harder than, let's say, somebody just going to an e-commerce site and clicking buy. Um, and so thinking about that when you develop that, you know, your process, and what the consumer is willing to do and how you balance the value of the product that you're selling against the challenge of actually buying that product. And those are the things you have to think about. And I just haven't seen so many great products in the consumer sector um, that have sort of been made like, would make the average person like, like yes, this thing should like really exist. And then pizza? Does that... <laughs> You said that um, the parts that you made with the shoes that you made were 1% of the shoes, or 60% of the parts. You also said, well, thank you. And you also said you couldn't do a day and you said, well, I'm going to say 18 months to do. But 80% of the product is one of the products. So how do you split? So two things. So product development timeline. That's half of it. And it's about your speed to bring a product to market. So what I'm saying there is effectively um, we're able to iterate much more rapidly because we're prototyping in real time. We're shipping product. We're gathering feedback from our customer. And we're putting that back into the algorithms that generate our product. And we have a sort of end-to-end -end feedback cycle there. Um, so bringing a product to market much faster. Um, on a very separate side of that is the cost structure and looking at what the cost structure of the product actually is. Um, and so for us and for anybody in 3D 
printing, your material is your number one cost. Um, and what that looks like at Souls is, you know, we have a, a small 3D printed component that's, let's say, is about 20% of our total product. Um, but of that, it's much, much more expensive than any other of the components on there. Everything else pales in comparison, frankly. Uh, labor, obviously, like goes in there as well. And so as you think about design for manufacturing, you know, thinking about how you can reduce labor and touch points and things like that. Um, but, but one is like, okay, this is cost of goods. Um, and one is from a product development process, this is how quickly you can iterate. All right, wonderful. On that note, thank you very much for being here. Thanks, everybody.